Okay, I have 11 o'clock, so thank you all for coming today for our presentation on academic applications of AI, uh, talking about our current work at San Diego State University. I appreciate everyone here knowing that we're up against the big Ithaca presentation, uh, so thank you for coming. Um, my name is Scott Walter, I'm the Dean of the University Library at SDSU, and I'm going to begin by asking each of my fellow panelists to introduce themselves as well. Hello, good morning. I'm Elisa Sobo. I'm a professor of anthropology at San Diego State University, and I'm also director for undergraduate research, and I'm also one of the AI fellows at SDSU, and you'll be hearing about that program momentarily. Hello, I'm Abir Mohammed, and I am a student at San Diego State University. I'm majoring in Africana Studies and Business Information Systems, and I'm also one of the AI student fellows. Good morning, I'm James Frazee, and serving as the Vice President for Information Technology and Chief Information Officer. So welcome, yes, and so over the past year, as we're gonna discuss, uh, the education sector has navigated one of the most rapid technological advancements in decades. This, of course, has been our theme this week. Uh, as we work around generative AI. SDSU has been at the forefront of this transformation with its AI student survey, its AI, AI fellows program, and its AI micro-credential, and the upcoming generative AI summit, which will be on April 12th. Generative AI will continue to shape the future of learning and evolve in the upcoming year to get out in front of it and learn how generative AI can support you and your students. Uh, we will talk about the, uh, the AI micro-credential and some opportunities to work together. Uh, so our outcomes today, uh, you can see here, we're gonna highlight the collaboration between the library, IT services, faculty, students, other campus units. We'll talk about some of the insights that have been derived from the SDSU AI student survey. We'll describe the launch and the advances in the academic AI micro-credential course. And we'll introduce you a little bit to the SDSU Senate IIT committee's draft guidelines for use of generative AI. I just want to add Scott on Please. that that uh, part of this is in response to the California State University Academic Senate's resolution from 2023 that was essentially a very loud cry for AI literacy training for our faculty. And we heard Leo, if you were in Leo's session earlier this morning, speak about the need for continuous improvement and continuous learning as we think about how to respond to these new technologies. And especially our faculty who are very concerned about these tools in terms of a potential liability and how we're addressing that at San Diego State. So that Senate, University Senate, across the entire California State University system, representing 500,000 students, 23 different campuses, uh, was absolutely a driver that uh, informed our work here. I'm not tall enough to see over the slide there. Don't <laughs> So we are building this, we wanted to make sure for this audience we understood, we are building this program on a history of great collaboration between uh, the library and IT services. These are just a few of the projects uh, that have been launched over the last decade. Um, my congratulations to my predecessor, Gail Etchmeyer, who's here in the office, uh, here in the audience, who was you know, some, uh, critical to all of these initiatives. But we've worked with IT on our makerspace, uh, on affordable learning solutions, which is our open educational resources program, our digital humanities center, uh, and a number of other initiatives. So when the opportunity came uh, to discuss AI, we were, we were ready to, to work with them and had this great foundation of working together. One of the most significant of those uh, recently was in the development of the FLEX uh, course, develop, course Design Institute, which was our, and by our, I really mean James and his team, um, 
response to the pandemic and the pivot to online learning. Uh, and I'll turn to James if he wants to talk a little bit about CDI. Sure. This, this built on our longstanding approach to enlisting faculty fellows. So this is something San Diego State's been doing uh, for some time now. In fact, the Course Design Institute launched in 2008. Prior to that, we had a partnership with Qualcomm, a local company here you might have heard of. They get a nickel, I think, every time one of us uses one of these things. Um, so that faculty fellows program really grew over time, and you'll hear more about our AI fellowships that we provide to faculty and students as well. Uh, but that was uh, what we turned to during the pandemic, and we worked with faculty to design a program by faculty for faculty that helped them navigate the move to fully online instruction, building on what we've been doing since 2008, taking high demand, kind of gateway, uh, bottleneck courses and making those available online, fully online in the summer. And we've had a long uh, practice of doing that with a lot of lower division general ed courses. So we had a foundation to build upon it was a choose-your-own-adventure experience where faculty had a dozen different elective modules to choose from and five core modules. One of those elective modules, which was developed by a faculty fellow from the library, was on making the library work for you. So that was just another example of our longstanding partnership. Yeah, and I think we've heard a lot uh, this week about the question of how will libraries get a seat at the table on uh, campus uh, approaches to AI. And so this was a great example of, of how at the last transformative moment, we made sure that the libraries and IT were working together on that big move. I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Sure, and I, you know, at any point, Abir and EJ and Scott just chime in because I'm sure I'll miss something. But this is a, you know, a, a very much of a multifaceted approach to addressing this profound moment that we find ourselves in. Um, we began by enlisting faculty fellows. Uh, one is Professor Sobo from Anthropology, another faculty member who you'll uh, learn about here in a moment is from information systems. So kind of a quantitative focus and a qualitative focus, very complementary uh, faculty members helping us. And then two AI student fellowships. One is a, one of our associated students, which is our uh, student government uh, leaders. And then a beer, interesting story, we met a beer we had a, uh, a faculty learning community focused on AI throughout the year, and we had these meetings in the Digital Humanities Center led by one of our library faculty members, and um, it was really geared towards faculty and staff, but a beer saw some of the digital signage on AI, was interested in AI, and was in this round table setting, and people were going around introducing themselves, and a beer said, oh, I'm a student, I better leave, and we're like, no, no, you're not going anywhere. We need you here, please don't leave. And then after that, I recruited her for a fellowship, which um, has turned into uh, some student employment working with IT, which has been great. So anyway, those, uh, those fellowships are, are key to our approach. The AI student survey that you'll hear more about, and you'll hear some, some data from that survey. Um, from what we understand, this is the largest AI student survey um, done in higher education so far. This was in October of 2023. We had 7,811 students respond to this survey, which is approximately 18% very large campus here at San Diego State. Uh, but that is remarkable. We're lucky if we get a 3% response rate to a student survey. So the fact that we had almost 20% of our students respond to a survey that took on average about 10 minutes to complete is extraordinary and speaks to how important this topic is to them. Um, then we worked with, of course, all along the way, our University Senate, you, you heard us talk about that, our Center for Teaching and Learning, our library professionals, and other key stakeholders across campus in student affairs and campus diversity. And really the emphasis was on providing a foundation for our faculty, again, moving them away from seeing these generative AI tools as a liability and as an, rather than uh, a liability and a tool for cheating to think about how important this was for our students in the world outside of school and how important it was going to be that for them to be competitive when going for high paying jobs. So that's just a little background on Can big I, picture. I'll just Please. add, um, one of the reasons I think that we did get such an, a, a shockingly high response rate was by including students from the very start in this 
initiative, if you kind of call it that, because the Associated Students, for example, was highly involved in um, even just getting out the word that the survey was available. So including every kind of stakeholder is really important to this kind of initiative. We'll talk a little bit more about the student involvement later. Yeah, great point. Board? Went to the survey? Yeah, I thought, uh, I thought that one was you, EJ, but I will say really quick before I punt it off to you that um, the Associated Student President, the focus of his platform, if you will, for his, uh, his year as president was on getting students high paying jobs. So there was a real strong alignment there. And one of the things that was unusual was we got so much support from our Associated Students government leaders that they allowed us to put some digital signage in the student union. The student union is actually part of Associated Students space, as well as our big recreation center, multi-million dollar, billion dollar, I don't even know if things gigantic, gymnasium. Um, they put digital signage in both of those locations, the student union and the Aztec Recreation Center, we call it, with a QR code to the survey. Um, that wouldn't have been done. As far as I know, that's the only time they've had digital signage that wasn't associated students' digital signage in those facilities. So that was a real big deal and uh, just speaks to the partnership with AS and, and how that really did allow us to get more attention. Yeah, yeah. It was, it, that was super important. If you don't mind, I'm going to stand up. I think I'll just go over here and Please. use that mic. Because, so I can see. <laughs> no, we're good. Stay here for a little. Oh, and it's right here, too, so I can see, see what I'm talking about. Um, and I can see you better, too, which is nice. Hello out there. Before, it was like just talking to the Zoom screen where you're, we couldn't see you from down here because of the lights. OK, anyway, having the students involved um, is reflected in another nice surprise that we got, which was that the survey was essentially representative. What these numbers are up here to show you um, to our delight, is that it wasn't that just one sort of subgroup of the students was, was really the, the high responding rate. You might assume, okay, it's gonna be the people over in engineering or the people over in wherever, we're not gonna have any students in English or art because they are, you know, no. And I think this is because A, AI is, um, as, as James was saying, just super important to the students. It's, it's, it's in the air now, so it's something that everybody's aware of important to them in terms of thinking about their future, thinking about school and so forth, but also having that involvement of the associated students meant the involvement of all of the different clubs and branches and so forth coming together from all over the campus, even our Imperial Valley campus, so that the word got out through those, it was like an old fashioned um, telephone tree. I used that metaphor a week ago and people didn't really get what I mean, but I hope you know what I mean, yes? So this really worked to our benefit and, and again, just to, um, tip and advice that if you're gonna try this, and our survey is available for other um, universities, colleges to try, just make sure to have that involvement. And then um, presto, you will be hearing from across the board instead of just one, one isolated group that happened to get the word. So not that we want you to look at these numbers, but it just, what, we're, what I'm gonna talk about when we talk about the students is it's just kind of, in general, our generic average everyday student representative of our student body. I should mention that our Imperial Valley campus is 110 miles east of here in a very rural, mm -hmm. agriculturally focused part of the state of California. Um, last I checked, had the highest unemployment rate in the state. Uh, so it was really important for us to be able to do some cross tabulations and compare what we saw here in our San Diego campus uh, and how that may be the same or different with the students out in Imperial Valley. We'll talk a little bit about that. Good to go. Okay, so we have a couple of slides. Um, I'm just going to give you a brief, some brief uh, summary of the responses. But again, we had a, a nice response rate, really pleasing to us. Um, and from that, we gleaned by looking at both the quantitative and qualitative uh, responses. And I realized we didn't tell you what was in the survey. There were a, a number of Likert style questions where you rate, you know, one to five kind of thing, whether you agree or disagree with the question. And then we had five qualitative open ended questions that people could answer in their own words toward the end. They were optional. Uh, we did incentivize participation. It wouldn't be fair to, to leave you with the impression that this was all 
free will. <laughs> well, it was free will, but there was the um, incentive. It wasn't giant. There were $110 Starbucks cards that the students could be entered into an opportunity drawing for, and then there was one iPad. So that also um, helped. We, so looking at what we got, 86% said AI would become an essential part of most professions. And this wasn't that much different between the colleges, and that's an important point, that across the board, we have some quotations on the slide, and the one I'll draw your attention to is, I'm studying arts, and AI offers exciting new ways to create. So it wasn't just the people in engineering, it was across the board. Do you wanna add to that, um, maybe? Oh, Give a... Yeah, just like, uh, students do really believe that AI will be part of their profession. We were, uh, we were presenting this with Sean last time, who's a senior director, and he was speaking on how he uses AI for some of his emails. And as a student hearing that, uh, you know you're going to be able to be use AI in the future. So it's nice to have a place where you could practice how to use that right now. So it was just, I think it really reflects on how the students feel. And that comes to some of the quotations at the bottom. So people realize this is going to be important. And at the same time, we need to learn about it. You guys need to help us. This is college. You're supposed to be training us, right, for our future careers. Help us. We need more practical AI exercises in our curriculum, was an example. Um, but and the very last quote is on there to make the point that it wasn't just a kind of black and white, this is the future, give it to us, it's all good kind of thing. There was a lot of nuance in the answers that showed that students are thinking in a very sophisticated way about the ethics, about social justice and so forth. So um, the social impact of AI in fields like mine should be carefully considered. These aren't one-off quotations. I mean, we're pulling them as examples, but we're pulling them as examples because this kind of thing was threaded through the qualitative answers, and it was supported by the quantitative answers as well. Just one thing on the incentive, because I'm, I'm hopeful that others will want to replicate the survey, which is, of course, available uh, for you all to remix, adapt, swallow whole as you see fit. Um, and even if you're interested, we'll give you the Qualtrics version to make it extra easy for you. But um, those incentives did, I think, make a difference. $110 gift cards. At San Diego State, we have, um, Gail, I think when Gail was there, we had four Starbucks. We're down to three now, uh, but one's bigger. Uh, so Starbucks seems to be a, a, a big motivator for students. And then, of course, that grand prize of the iPad. Um, and we have to frame these as opportunity drawings. These are not raffles. That would be gambling. Uh, so we're, we're framing those as opportunity drawings. Okay. Yeah, just like one thing on the yeah. social impact um, of the use of AI, students are still really interested in that human interactions that they get to have with their professors. And they don't want AI to like necessarily replace that. I think it's really important to note that. And then the incentives were also great, but I think we're also just very interested in just how AI will also affect our education. And I think that also was just a motivation to take the survey as well. Yeah. And you know what, adding on to there, we had sandwich boards too, just kind of positioned around the campus with QR code. And I don't know if your campus is like our campus, but it's very rare that I walk across campus and don't see everybody looking at their phones. And if they're not looking at their phones, they're looking for a reason to be looking at their phones. So it, it, that also was another, I think, factor in people just going, oh, okay, I'll do this, because they didn't have any, no one was calling them at the time or texting them at the time. So having those QR codes out there on sandwich boards really helped as well. Yeah, wherever there was a line, and yeah. there's lines all over the place at a big university like ours, we put a sandwich board. So if somebody was standing in a line, they could snap their QR code and make it easy for them to take the survey. Because, God forbid, they should talk to one another face to face. But 51% <clears throat> reported that they're already using the AI in their coursework. This was last October. The statistic is in line with statistics from even high school students last October. About half of them already have been using it. No doubt it's probably higher now. At the same time, they weren't hearing from teachers about using AI. Only one in three instructors even talked about it um, and gave them an, an okay or like, yeah, you could maybe use this, but the other people were silent. 
And this is a problem. They're using it, and here's some of the reasons why they use it. I use it to double check my math problems. It helps me with language translations. I like this one. It has made, made it more interesting. I'm gonna tell you something. The, the next part of that quote was that it actually isn't saving me time. The person was getting into these rabbit holes, but they were enjoying themselves, right? So what's wrong with that? Um, it's helped me focus in this kind of thing. And yet, there's a sense of, well, but are teachers wanting us to do this? One of our other AI fellows did a quick scan of the syllabi for their courses for last fall. They had five separate courses. Only one of those mentioned anything about AI, and it was actually kind of vague, so it wasn't even that helpful. And this leaves students in kind of an information gap, you know, what, well, we're using this, are we supposed to use it? And so that's an upper thing. division engineering major. Had one of five Before. classes mentioned AI That's in the right. syllabus. Yeah, one in five. Yours was similar, or you didn't have any? I think you had no, none. It was one in six for me this semester. Oh. So, and it was also a very vague um, <laughs> statement about not just using it. So, so you're kind of, you know, should I? Shouldn't I? I don't know. So here, teachers should be trained on how to effectively incorporate AI. We want our teachers to know about this, but going back to Abir's point, without replacing the human interaction. I don't want to be taught and graded by a robot. So students see this as a tool. They don't see this as a replacement. They see it as a tool. Uh, we can go on to the next one. As far as access to this tool, this is something that I think every campus needs to consider. Um, we did find that the more kinds of devices students had access to, the more likely they were to say that AI has positively affected their education at San Diego State. So in other words, if you have access to one device, maybe a phone, versus the person who has access to four different kinds, they have a tablet, they have this and they have that, the students were less comfortable and they were also, they were just less likely to feel at ease and feel like they could, um, th that it wasn't such a mystery to them. So. We're concerned about this, but the students also are concerned about this. And it, it, again, I keep coming back to the point that the students really do have a sophisticated understanding of this, and they see problems. They see problems about that digital divide that we need to understand too. Um, another angle on this is that if we are gonna all be bringing AI programs into our campus, that's gonna mean higher fees because AI software costs and so forth. Students are worried about that. It has the potential to give people an unfair advantage. Is every student gonna be able to afford and so forth? One student, um, this was just a one-off, but they suggested that if you're gonna put AI into your courses as an instructor or as a librarian or whatever, that you use stuff that's in the public domain so that everybody could have access. So this digital divide issue is something that could even be compounded by AI. The people who have access, everybody has access to the free, but what about the people who have access to the paid version, which is so much better? And what's that going to do to to expectations? You have maybe some addition to this, Abir? Um, yeah, I think that divide is really concerning for students, and we want to make sure that everybody has the uh, opportunity to be able to use Chat GPT or all these other generative AI devices, um, and to be able to get training off of them just like any other students that has more devices or um, is, has better uses of those technologies. Yeah, the number that we're, we're seeing in, in different parts of the literature is 10 hours, that you need to have about 10 hours with any kind of app in order to have a facility with it and feel comfortable with it. And if you don't have access, how are you gonna get that 10 hours? There's also seems to be um, a situation where if you don't have a lot of access and you just try and you put in the first prompt that you think of, you're gonna get back garbage because obviously you don't know how to prompt yet because you haven't trained up in that. You're gonna get back garbage and you're gonna back off. Oh, this isn't working. So that's another sort of a way that that chasm can be widened and deepened through this lack of equal access to, to devices, to time on devices and so forth. I, I just want to say real quick on that previous slide, Scott, that um, you know, if you use number of devices as a proxy for privilege, we see a, a pretty dramatic gap between the students who have more devices and those who don't. And that's in terms of tool usage, 
their opinions, they're, they're warmer, I would say, about how AI can help them on their educational journey, and their expectations for us are higher for those students who have more of these devices. So, you know, and I don't think it's necessarily the number of devices so much as having the skills and access to them. So that's, that's a major, you know, finding for us, and this is something that we're going to be doing longitudinally, so we're going to provide the survey to our students again in October of this year, and we're going to look at how those changes, uh, you know, take place over time. I should also mention that um, several other universities in the California State system are also replicating the survey, so it'll be interesting to see how the results compare, let's say, in the Central Valley of California or the Bay Area of California versus San Diego. And San Diego State is maybe unusual relative to some of the other campuses. We had, a, I think, the latest numbers, like 120,000 applications for this incoming fall cohort will accept about 5,000 first-time freshmen out of 120,000 applications. So we can be fairly selective. So what our student body looks like may be altogether different than, let's say, a community college in another part of the state or something. So that's why we would love for you all, wherever you happen to be geographically, to, to think about that survey there to see how those differences compare across the country. Okay. From our survey of results, um, we've collected some qualitative data, um, and this is pretty much speaking on what our students, how our students feel about um, the use of AI in the classroom. Some students are feeling disoriented. They're saying, I'm not sure what's allowed and what's not, um, just tell us what to do. They're seeking guidance. Um, when professors make statements like, uh, you, the use of AI has consequences, but they don't really elaborate on that any further, it causes confusion for students, and they're not able to leverage AI. And it's like saying you can't use Google in the classroom. Um, AI could be leveraged, generative AI could be leveraged in so many different ways, um, and saying just not to use it really causes that confusion. Um, and then there's also being worried about cheating. Some people are saying, will I depend on the professor if it's deemed as cheating or not? Um, a lot of the AI detection tools that we have nowadays are not 100% accurate, and we can't really fully rely on them. So when a professor is just relying on a detection tool to determine if an assignment is considered cheating, it's really concerning for students. Um, and also students are feeling distrusted. If I write a really good essay, will I be accused of AI usage? Um, this really pertains to our international students and English as second language students who sometimes when they write an essay, it can, it can sound robotic, I would know as a trilingual student. Um, and so, like, doing good work, is that going to make my professor suspicious of my good work? That's also another concerning fact. Um, and then towards the end, just that there needs to be more trust. Um, I think it's important to have that open conversations between faculty members and students um, about the use of AI in the classroom. We, we just need to have more active conversations and to know that students are also concerned um, just as hard as it is for faculty to determine what to do in this age. <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're all disoriented. Yes. <laughs> the students are highly disoriented, but the faculty are disoriented too. And that's part, of, that's part of the reason why maybe there's been this lag, but we need to fix that. We need to get over it. The distrust is a, is a real issue. I mean, it's just not, it's not fair. It's not right. to for, And this is faculty. And I know with librarians, you see, you know students do the work because one of the first sort of signs that this thing is going to be, well, not one of the first, but an early sign. That is, was people coming to the librarian with a reference, and the reference was not real. Does that, does that resonate with anybody? The sense of like, what? This is just completely garbage. Where did you even get this? So you know students are doing their work. They want to do the work. They want to do a good job. Too often, faculty um, have that immediate knee-jerk reaction of, they're all cheaters. And we are really trying to shift the narrative on that, because from what we saw in the survey, it's not at all the case. The students really want to know 
how should we use this? We don't want to break any rules. So give us some guidelines so that we can do the right thing. Ready? Yeah, and this is you know so important for us as technologists, especially. And if anyone was in the session in this room earlier today, and Emily from Elsevier was talking, she mentioned a large language model. I was I was dying to ask her which one was it? Llama? Was it OpenAI? But it's easy for us technologists to get caught up in the geek speak. So it's super important to have these relationships. And in this case, we partnered with, as I mentioned, Associated Students. Uh, our University Senate. You'll hear a little bit more about our work around guidelines for faculty. We're really leaning into guidelines and not to policy. We think that it's really too early to have a hard and fast policy. You might end up painting yourself in a corner. Uh, and especially in light of disciplinary differences, what might work for our information systems folks may not work for our anthropology folks. And so you have to have some flexibility uh, in terms of those guidelines. Again, having some heuristics as opposed to hard and fast rules. That's just our approach at San Diego State. But uh, lots of other key partners helping us along the way. We mentioned the Center for Teaching and Learning. Uh, they co-hosted with our Digital Humanities Center a faculty learning community that focused on AI. Um, again, that's where we discovered a beer. That was that was huge. Uh, and you know, these partnerships are absolutely essential for spreading the word because each of us has our own you know, uh, silo that we live in, and, and that has been really essential for getting the, the traction that we've seen today. I can speak to this because I was on this committee, but I'd love for my colleagues to also weigh in here. Um, so again, um, one of the things that faculty are most concerned about, just like when they move to teaching in a new modality, is assessment. How am I gonna do assessment in a way that is meaningful, that is, um, you know, that addresses any concerns that the faculty might have around academic misconduct. Uh, and it's funny because when people have said to me, oh, we need an AI policy, I say, we have an AI policy. It's called our academic integrity policy. And so uh, we need to maybe adapt our academic integrity policy to include these considerations, but I'm suggesting that we don't need a standalone uh, AI policy. Instead, we need guidelines. And this is an example from our University Senate. This is working its way through our executive committees and through the, the University Senate uh, governance process right now. But um, you'll see here at the bottom of this, um, just being clear about what's allowed, what's disallowed, what's restricted. Um, what do you need to document? How do you document it? Do you document the entire prompt? Do you document the output of the prompt? How far do you want to go as a faculty member? Uh, and you need to be really intentional. And this is a lot of work for our faculty, of course. You know, it means potentially retooling uh, their assessment strategy, uh, especially if it's, you know, a handful of high stakes assessments, you know, two papers and a test or something along those lines. And I've always said that you can determine the sophistication of someone's instructional design or pedagogical approach by looking at their grade center in the learning management system. If there's two or three grades in there at the end of the term, yeah. Um, so, you know, if this is opening up, creating space for conversations about more frequent low stakes assessment, process over product, opportunities to get students working more with one another, that's awesome. You know, any opportunity we have, whether it's the pandemic, generative AI, heck yeah, let's have those conversations because this is really, I think, a, a, an exciting time for us in terms of how can we continuously evolve our teaching strategies. Okay, so one space for those conversations, we can move ahead, is our micro-credential. So this was informed by the survey results as well as all the other sort of information gathering that we did, and it's a way for faculty to get smart quick about AI. They are one of the reasons that so many didn't address it in their syllabi, syllabus, syllabuses, is because they just didn't know. It's, it's another thing on our plate, and how are we gonna cope with this, and maybe if I stick my head in the sand, it'll go away. No. So we're here to help, and we designed this micro-credential that, in theory, you could finish in two hours if you didn't want to go ahead and do the activities and get a badge, but if you wanted to get a badge, you'd take four, four plus hours, and you could be a badged, micro-credentialed uh, academic applications of AI knowledgeable 
faculty member, the information in this is meant um, as information. And we are pitching this informationally. It's voluntary. Although, interestingly enough, uh, before day one, we had, I think, about one in five faculty members had already signed up, ready for the launch. We have, I think, 600 plus now uh, in the program. But you don't have to do it. It's voluntary, which, which makes it a lot easier. Nobody's trying to push AI down your throat. And the idea is that even if you're a skeptic, no <coughs> worries. This is going to give you the information you need to opt out in an informed fashion. And who knows, maybe along the way, you might find something of value in the AI. So um, there are five modules. It's on Canvas, which is our learning management system. First, an overview, how does AI even work? Then um, a whole section on ethics, responsible use. A section just opening up people's eyes to what AI can do. If you've never played with it, of course, you don't know what it can do. And there is a lot of aha. I can tell you that from looking at some of the feedback that's come in. Then there's a, a module that helps people to find the apps that are right for them. As you can imagine, diverse faculty from all kinds of different disciplines. What's right for one isn't going to be right for the other. Math people need this. Art people need that. So a very quick sort of, I don't know, whirlwind tour of various different apps that are available. They choose some apps, and then they practice some prompting. So there's a whole section on prompt engineering and activities that they will do. Turning in the activities then will trigger the, the badging process for you. It's in a read, view, do format, very simple, uh, very straightforward. Um, each module kind of repeats the same structure. And um, I think we can go on to the next slide, or? Yeah? So uh, first round of assessment is ongoing. 662 learners enrolled. Good, my estimate wasn't that far off. 64 completions so far. And here's just one of the quotes from um, one of the activities. I came to AAAI concerned about catching plagiarism and discouraging students from using AI at all. Now I'm thinking about it as a tool for me and my students. I can use this, woohoo, right? Woohoo, this is a win. And we, this isn't the only one that was like that. I was surprised, I think that um, you guys have heard me say this before, it's like, well, when's the other shoe gonna drop? We really aren't hearing complaints. We're hearing mostly, hey, thank you, I never knew. I never knew. We hope to release a CSU-wide version on April 12th at our summit. Um, I think that's everything's going. It's happening, yes. It's, hap it's happening. Um, and then next plan is for a student-specific student version and a staff-specific version. Staff can are free to use this one, but there's, for example, there's a syllabus statement um, section that they, then they just would bypass or do something else instead. So we're going to try and do a tailored version for these um, particular populations. Uh, next slide. I'll just add for the library folks. We have about, I think, eight to ten library faculty who've signed up for the micro credential. Uh, and even though, so it gives you the foundational, its focus and its activities are around, you know, syllabi statements and assessment strategies and so on, which may not be directly relevant to the library, but what we're really hoping is that A, we'll then have that core group of you know, maybe six, eight library faculty members who've been through it who can then initiate a discussion within the library of some of these tools that we've heard about at, at CNI this week, um, but also who can be involved, especially in the student version, as that begins to roll out uh, as, you know, as, we, as part of our first year instruction program. And I'm glad you brought that up because inside of this micro-credential, there are a number of links out to our library because the library has resources, resources on academic integrity and plagiarism and so forth, and on citations. How do I cite with AI? So there's been a lot of um, cross-collaboration in bringing these tools together. Okay, where do we go from here? Review, revise, share the micro-credential, and um, begin discussion amongst the librarians about pedagogical issues in the library, just like you just said. Um, yeah, and just wanna, one real, one real quick you? thought just on that first bullet as far as this iterative approach. You know, you're never done with this kind of thing. We're getting constant feedback, and you know, there's a lot of optional activities that we've included in the micro-credential, kind of rabbit holes people can go down. and people can't help themselves, they want to take this side street. So we have heard feedback from the, the faculty that it's taking a lot longer than we, we build it as four hours. Um, that's if you're really, I mean, just militant about not going down all of these optional pathways we've provided. So that's something that we need to think yeah. about as we think about 
the student iteration of this, which is something that we'll be rolling out in the coming academic year. Started with the faculty and then we're gonna have a version. Many of those five modules can just be uh, applied to the student version, but the, a couple of them that are more uh, specifically today for faculty geared towards teaching and learning will be adapted to have more of a career focus. So how can you use generative AI for finding jobs, preparing for jobs, and all of the things around uh, that workforce readiness. And I would say again, um, right now the early discussions in our library have been in cataloging. Uh, and how AI might be used in description. Um, but I think, as I said, once we get some more of these folks through the program, uh, combined with some of the discussions facilitated by, you know, programs like this one, we'll be able to look at things like, you know, transcription of our many, many oral histories in special collections, or the use of our FAQs uh, to, to fuel a chatbot uh, for ready reference, and, and I think tying in with the IT knowledge base as well. Um, so that will be an interesting discussion. Uh, I'm looking forward to having it. James. Yeah, Call sure. Yeah, and if you didn't pick up on it already, um, you know, there's a, there's a digital object identifier for the survey that we created that we're happy to share. Again, happy to share the Qualtrics version of the survey if you're interested in seeing that. Uh, the entire University of Hawaii system, all of their four-year and community colleges have replicated the survey. Uh, I mentioned the other uh, institutions here in California. We have places as far away as the United Arab Emirates and Canada who have um, taken the survey. In some cases, they'll take our student survey and make a faculty version. That's fine. Whatever you want to do, have at it. Uh, but really trying to encourage people, if you're formulating an AI strategy and you haven't engaged your students, there's a real missed opportunity there. So uh, that's, that's the call to action on that one. And then, I mean, ideally, we would love to be able to compare and contrast results with other institutions that look like us, that don't look like us. Um, we're a Hispanic serving institution here be interesting to see, you know, what it might look like, what the data might look like at HBCU. Uh, it might be interesting to see what it looks like at, you know, a variety of different, you know, independent private colleges versus public research universities, et cetera. Um, we're also looking to form an equitable AI alliance to bring those costs down, uh, leveraging uh, consortial agreements uh, to make sure we're holding these tech giants to task. Uh, the, the prices are frankly outrageous and completely out of reach for uh, institutions like ours, uh, public institutions here in the California State University system. We're like the middle child, by the way, of, of the California higher education family. We've got our UCs, super well resourced. We've got our community colleges, which are also surprisingly well resourced. And then here we are in the middle, uh, trying to you know, get two nickels to rub together in the, in the CSU system. So this is really important for us, this equitable AI alliance, and something that we would love to, to band together with you all on. And then again, to just leverage this micro-credential, this is something uh, that we're excited about and want to share widely. I will say, um, again, though, I think we'll do some work locally, just thinking back to Leo's comment about uh, library and AI competencies and the effort that ACRL is going to undertake to build up competencies. I think it would be wonderful, I don't know if Leo's in the audience, uh, I, I think it would be wonderful if we could sort of marry those two things because we do have a framework uh, for the micro-credential, we have a framework of modules. This one is aimed at faculty, but you could easily see it being aimed at librarians, and not even necessarily just academic librarians. Um, that I think would be, a, it would be great if we could some, you know, leverage these two things and bring them together as opposed to building parallel. Thank you all. We have about 15 minutes for questions. Hopefully you are brimming with them. I see Cyril in the audience. I know he has a question, but please go ahead. Um, my question is uh, the micro-credential course, do you have plans to provide that through OER? Because that would, I think, also 
dovetail nicely with the survey <laughs> to be able to see those courses and understand how to create something similar. Yeah, so we're, for the California State University system, we're making that available through our shared Canvas instance across all of the 23 campuses. Um, we are working with our global campus to make that content freely available via Coursera. So all of that content would be freely available to anyone in the world uh, through the Coursera platform. If you wanted the micro-credential, the digital badge, if you will, there's a nominal cost for that. Um, we'll be announcing that also on April 12th when we have this big summit at San Diego State. Um, so that's the way to get access to that freely. Um, again, you would pay if you wanted to have that little digital badge on your LinkedIn profile or something, but I don't think that's what's really motivating people. I think they just want access to the content. So we have a commitment to making that freely available. Not quite OER, um, but it's, it's a step in the right direction. Of course, it makes our, our uh, executives happy to know that this might be a revenue stream as well. Back to the scrappy CSU part I was talking about earlier. I was taking a picture of this. Kudos to the AV team in here, even though I feel like I'm like at a rock show or something. But um, they've got a little timer, and we can see our slides and everything. Good job, people. Um, Super and I, helpful. I'm taking notes for the summit that we have coming up here uh, in a couple weeks. That clock is great, yes. Gail. Thank you for the presentation. And um, I did have a question that you started to answer about looking at a, a university or CSU-wide platform. Um, and I was thinking about something like Microsoft Copilot, which I know we're working with, to see if that would be something that would equalize access to AI for the students. Yeah, I can speak to that. So we are using the commercial version of Microsoft Copilot at San Diego State, which has data protection, which means any of your prompts, any of the output is not being used to train their models. Um, that is, they get you, the license cost is really nominal. Where they get you on is consumption. So imagine you get so many credits, scale. once you've exceeded that amount of credits, we in IT have to come up with some sort of mechanism where you, and you'll get this, have to enter your Oracle account string, right? Because otherwise we'll just get eaten alive by this. So we're actually in the midst of, uh, pretty far along in fact, in a partnership agreement with UCSD, which is hosting their own. Um, you've probably heard of this Triton GPT that is uh, built um, locally on-prem, if you will, at the San Diego Supercomputer Center. And this is an example of an AI alliance where we're gonna you know, join forces with a, a, a regional colleague here at the University of California system uh, to make those resources more accessible and affordable, frankly. Um, and we're ingesting in, we're starting with general IT help, so we're ingesting all of our ServiceNow knowledge base articles, FAQs that we have from the library to make getting help easier as it relates to IT, kind of low-hanging fruit. But there's a lot of other examples. HR is a great example where managers are often, you know, scrambling to try and find position description examples, performance improvement plan, you know, resources and things along those lines to help them with their leadership work. Um, so HR is another um, real kind of sweet spot for us as we think about how we might ingest our own content and make that easier for people to get at 24-7. Um, but yeah, the costs, are, the costs are extraordinary. I will say, you know, um, and I'm not a big Microsoft fan, you probably can't tell this is an Apple, um, but uh, I shouldn't say that, this is being recorded, isn't it? Uh, well, uh, the, the second half of that is, I would say Microsoft's actually ahead of just about everybody right now. Given their relationship with OpenAI, um, I think they're, they are very far along. Um, and not to say that AWS and Google and these other companies aren't right there, but I'd say uh, Microsoft has a bit of an advantage today, uh, but the only thing I can guarantee is that everything will change, so. Cyril? I had to deal with Scott's prompt and say, thank you all very much. I, I heard earlier the idea that um, low stakes assessments um, are really a good thing, and I think course redesign is really important in 
the AI generation um, evolution. So how are you planning to strategically support faculty through the transitions that they have to make? Um, because a lot of it requires rethinking quizzes, exams, writing exercises, to be other types of uh, activities. I prefer project-based learning. So I'm interested in hearing how do you want, plan to explore that with faculty? Thank you. Yeah, super curious to hear from my colleagues, I'll say. Um, excellent question. I think the most important thing we can do is provide lots of examples because often faculty aren't aware of some of the possibilities that exist with some of these tools and some really dynamic ways to leverage them in a way that actually makes it more interesting for you as the instructor, as well as more meaningful and applicable for the students, again, as it relates to their career advancement. But curious to hear from EJ and others. I'll just um, pick up on that in terms of the micro-credential. Although we can't do very much in only four hours, we do lean into examples that are about process, not product kinds of um, instances and showing people um, different apps that can help with that and different strategies of ways to, you know, oh, you could try this assignment, you could try that. So that's one way to just kind of keep sprinkling it in. Yeah. Yeah, having students submit drafts of their paper mm -hmm. after a peer review where the, they have to document the peer review. So it's not all about the big paper, right? It's about, you might have five different you know, touch points on that paper before you end up with the big summative version of the paper. <clears throat> it really gets them thinking about it. That's how, like the stuff I write, <clears throat> there's a half dozen people who've read it before it goes out to the whole university because I'm like, I, I want a faculty member to read it. I want a student to read it. I want somebody else who's a colleague of mine to read it just to make sure I haven't missed something or maybe there's uh, something that they might think would, would make it stronger. Um, and I think those kinds of activities, baking those into your assessment strategy really goes a long way. There's an appeal to ego too, in a way, because one of the things we remind in the micro-credential, and we do this gently, is just that, you know, you, you get that final paper in or whatever, and you spend, you make comments, and the student's not gonna read that because they need to move on to their next class. And so if you really wanna make a difference as an instructor, it's well before the last few days of course. It's your, your feedback as a teacher that you're giving all along the way. So we just kinda try and sprinkle in that kind of information. I'm just curious about um, when you think about designing the micro-credential for staff, so I'm thinking from the library perspective, we kind of need to know about AI in terms of how our faculty and our students are using it, so those, uh, those possibilities that, that would be similar to maybe what was in your, what you designed for faculty, but then we also need, and I think um, was uh, referred to earlier uh, about using it in catalog, we also need to know from a staff perspective about AI and its possibilities for our workflows, whether that's our hiring workflows, our, our um, cataloging workflows, our, our reference workflows, all those different things. And that's just for the library and then each organization or academic support unit across the, the campus will have different things that they need to think about. So um, it, just curious as how you're thinking about the one for staff and kind of at what level of, I guess, opportunities and examples you're, you're you were thinking about, is it on that workflow side or is it teaching staff about how your faculty and students are using um, AI? Yeah. So, <clears throat> sorry about that. One of the things that makes the micro-credential unique, I think in the eyes of many people who enter into it and they're surprised, is that some of the information we're sharing is not necessarily about teaching, it's not necessarily about the student, but it is exactly what you're talking about. It's like, oh, you could make your life easier. These tedious things that you wish you could do it in, in, in five minutes that has taken you two hours. So we give examples of that kind of thing. And I can imagine maybe having an AI library fellow to help collect that kind of information so that when we, if there's a new iteration just for library people, that it would reflect the particular kinds of work that they do. Yeah, I think it's important for the staff to just give them permission to use these tools because like our students, more often than not, they are using them, but they're doing it kind of, you know, in the shadows of the organization. And we, you know, we did a, um, an AI shark tank within the IT division. There's about 
200 IT professionals at San Diego State. We invited them all to pitch an idea. We gave away a $10,000 grand prize, like, hey, we'll help you build this thing. What do you, what kind of, the idea for that whole event was really to tell people it's okay to use these tools. We're, we're good with it. Um, and then, you know, of course, we need to also put some boundary conditions in place around privacy and making sure that we're being very mindful of all of these compliance, you know, uh, regulations that we, all of us here have to face. Uh, but I think it's important to just give them permission and they will come up with some very creative ways of being more effective and efficient. Um, and you know, every new technology that comes along promises to save time. Has any technology saved us time yet? No. So now we're able to do more, right? Um, but just trying to give people a little bit of their life back would be that would be a double bonus for us, I think. And you know, any ways that we can do that that's ethical, of course, and being responsible would be a long, go a long way. And I think just recognize, I mean, there, we haven't done anything like this yet at San Diego State, but I could see us doing like a spotlight on a staff member who's using AI in some really uh, creative way that's saving them time or helping them be more effective in, in terms of the service they're providing to the community and just recognizing them and celebrating them and holding them up as an example, again, to give people who are scratching their head about how they might using it the go ahead to, yeah, try, try it out, see what you think. I have to say, so I, I'm actually a medical anthropologist, and as you're speaking, I'm thinking about a paradigm in public health called harm reduction, which is basically, um, you're gonna use this, so let's find a safe way to use it. So giving people the parameters, yes, use it, and make sure you bleach your needles, or don't give private information into the, into the learning. So these kinds of guardrails or guide rails that people really want. Like, we're gonna do it, we're gonna do it responsibly. Mm. Okay, I think we have time for one more question, if anyone has a burning last item. If not, let me thank my colleagues for coming down the hill uh, to join us at CNI today, and, um, and to say, yeah, we really are excited. Um, we're gonna be launching a number of things at the summit on April 12th. Uh, I know that my CSU library colleagues, uh, some of whom are here at CNI, We've been thinking a lot about how we're going to leverage this across the system, uh, which again will be made easier by the CSU-wide version of the micro-credential. Uh, all of us are facing these things uh, across our 23 campuses, but our resources are so very different that a, a tool like this and a program like this, I think could really help us to, to raise the, the foundational level of library engagement with AI tools and also see where we might be able to uh, share in a way that allows some of the more well-resourced campuses or our central chancellor's office to support some of the campuses that are less well-resourced or have fewer staff. Um, I'll just add as a final note in regard to sharing, if you'd like access to um, the link to the survey, if you'd like to um, have access to a link to the public version of the, the survey findings, which in fact our other AI faculty colleague isn't here because they're in Las Vegas making the first public presentation that's focused on the findings themselves. It'll be published in the proceedings of the SANI something meeting Thursday. The link is all available. All you have to do is, is, is Google or use whatever browser you want. Just SDSU, IT, AI, and you'll get right to the, to the web page that has all of those links there. Yeah, so there's a peer-reviewed publication that's in press right now that's the Association for the Advancement of Computing and Education. I think I got that right, AACE. Uh, and so... Um, yeah, there, so we're, we just scratched the surface of the findings here. So if you really want to lean into the, to the methodology and the survey uh, findings in uh, some depth, um, encourage you to take a look at that publication. Thank you all.